Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Today we've got a special guest from uh, Botanics Labs and that's the founder, Willem, coming to us from New York, did you say, Willem? Absolutely. Hey, nice to meet you, everyone. Nice to meet you, Alex. Thank you very much. And you guys are a Bitcoin Layer 2 project. We've been focusing a lot of our research and YouTube videos lately on um, Bitcoin DeFi and it's flourishing. So do you want to maybe give us a um, quick intro into your background and how you got into crypto in general before we dive specifically into botanics? Yeah, sounds good. Um, so Willem grew up in Belgium, actually. So I lived most of my life there, have their uh, uh, small mathematics background and then ended up doing electrical engineering. Um, then in the Masters of Electrical Engineering, actually focused on cryptography. So that was my first touch point actually with Bitcoin. Uh, but I researched in authenticated encryption, um, basically uh, trying to break algorithms in that. Then ended up um, moving around. So moved from Belgium to Saudi Arabia, lived there for two years. And that's actually where I didn't fall in the rabbit hole yet when I was doing cryptography, but I fell in the rabbit hole while living in the Middle East. I saw hyperinflation happening there in Lebanon, saw people get their bank accounts seized and then basically very quickly fell down the rabbit hole, saw the bigger pictures and basically yeah, the power this technology can have for yeah, billions of people around the world. Um, after that, I moved to the US, so went to Boston, um, got into the Harvard Business School. And it's actually there where I started building uh, botanics and now uh, recently moved to New York. Fantastic. Well, you've already raised a couple of interesting points there as well. One of the things we've been talking about is how um, everyone's always so focused on the US and maybe the ETF or US specific news around crypto. But as you've just said, it's all these other places that we're trying to remind people have huge populations. A lot of them have better, more friendly crypto regulations. Is there anything else I guess you wanted to add? Do you see the more potential for real world use and adoption like in these other places outside the US? No, absolutely. I think it's a very interesting uh, um, paradox because the US has, of course, the biggest amount of liquidity, but the business case or the how easy it is to see the power of uh, Bitcoin and sound money is, of course, less big in the US like or, or in, uh, in Europe. Like You don't really see that easy, but go talk to anyone who's lived in a hyperinflating economy and it's like it's just like that to get it like you don't have to explain it even and so yeah. it's a very interesting uh, thing to see play out fantastic i might even ask you about that electrical engineering as well to tie up at the end because i've got some interesting thoughts on that as well it's a very cool background you've got to get into crypto and scaling so um from a top-down approach what are your thoughts or how did you come about to make this the thing you want to work on in terms of bitcoin and scaling and how has what's been capable of being developed on Bitcoin changed over the years? I know Vitalik originally spoke about colored coins and we've had the tap, Taproot upgrade recently, which has allowed for a lot more functionality and um, ordinals and stamps and that type of thing. So how have you seen those protocol upgrades on Bitcoin and what they can now allow? No, absolutely. I love it. I think um, Taproot also enabled us. And so... Uh, basically, actually, the the origin of botanics is like a year and a half ago, like mid bull run. I was trying to figure out where this whole space was going to go to, um, because on the one hand, like last bull run was like a big paradox. You had Bitcoin. It's like the biggest capital pool, but almost zero utility on top of it, like yeah. almost zero, zero. Like there was nothing there really that reached product market fit. And on the other hand, you had uh, everything outside of Bitcoin, so many applications, so much utility being created, so much value being created. And so I was trying to figure out a way, how, how is this going to evolve? And what made the most sense is that a lot of that utility actually would come back to Bitcoin and being built on Bitcoin. And I always had this idea that anything that will reach product market fit outside of Bitcoin will reach product market fit on Bitcoin. And then, of course, ordinals happen. Now we have BRC20s and you see that theory basically uh, playing out. Um, and yeah, I, I, I love it. Um, there's so much being built, so much activity back. Um, so it's, uh, it's great to see that happen. Yeah, as you mentioned, there wasn't uh, a lot going on utility-wise for Bitcoin. So maybe just quickly for people at home, I guess the main ones that have been around for a while, the Lightning Network that people are pretty familiar with, that's probably had the most adoption in places like El Salvador where they're trying those those wallets and that type of thing. Um, the Liquid Network, which is pretty federated, just mainly for the exchanges to move 
um, money around between. Um, Rootstock is one that has been around for a fair while now. Again, we haven't really seen any great protocols blossom from that or real use case and adoption. Um, and Stacks is probably that new one that people are starting to get familiar with as well. So do you have any just general thoughts on any of those, maybe the pros and cons of each or anything like that? No, absolutely. Let me break. Before we go into that, let me um, give a little bit explanation of what Botanics actually is. Yeah. Um, so we're second layer EVM on Bitcoin and the EVM is fully equivalent. Meaning that basically in your MetaMask and on the EVM, everything runs on Bitcoin. The native currency is Bitcoin, but you can take any smart contract on Ethereum. You take the code, you copy paste it, like literally the smart contract code. So you paste it uh, in Botanics and boom, you have it. So suddenly, basically, you can deploy any application that you've seen and deploy it on, uh, on Bitcoin. And so... I think over the last few years, like you said, we've seen Lightning, we've seen uh, Liquid, we've seen Woodstock, we've seen Stacks. And I think compared to all of those, we differentiate us quite a little bit. Um, so Lightning is really optimized for payments, um, payments of Bitcoin. I think it has struggled with adoption because a lot of people, when they pay for something, they still think in their denominated currency like dollars. When yeah. you go to, could go to the store, you don't think, oh, I need to pay this amount of Bitcoin here, you still think like the local currency. Yeah. And so uh, it's very much a psychology thing. I think it will take still a, a, a few more years before people will actually start to denominate their life in, in Bitcoin. Um, so Lightning doesn't have smart contracts. And I think Woodstock is probably the most um, comparable. So Woodstock is uh, at the moment a centralized multisig with 10 proof of work uh, basically behind it as a consensus. Yep. Uh, where they do merge mining, but it is EVM compatible. Yep. Um, so you can translate your EVM code um, to like uh, what's needed for Woodstock and then deploy it. But Woodstock has a very difficult uh, user experience, I believe. Like it's uh, very hard to use and it's very hard to, uh, to get onto Woodstock. Because it was actually built before uh, Taproot. Um, and so in comparison to us, we basically build a fully decentralized layer two. So we can go into that later. It's called the spider chain. It's basically yeah. allowed, allows anyone to run a full node, uh, which makes us by uh, a very quick pace, uh, probably the most decentralized layer two compared to any uh, other of the, of the roll-ups. Um, and we actually optimized for user experience in the sense that um, bridging from Bitcoin to the second layer of Botanics feels exactly the same as bridging from Ethereum to Arbitrum. Okay. Um, so it's a very easy user experience, and that's fully enabled by uh, Taproot. Um, so without Taproot, this wasn't possible, for example. And then um, we have Stacks, and so I consider Stacks more like a, a polygon in that sense because it runs on the Stacks token. It's more like a sidechain, uh, so to speak. But I'm very happy, like they're getting huge amount of traction. They've been around for a bit now, um, and um, I actually hope there's more layer two people. And I, I know there's teams building out there as well, because the more infrastructure is getting built, the more applications can come uh, back to Bitcoin. So I'm uh, very happy that uh, there's so much development happening. But in essence, um, to summarize what differentiates us here is we're fully EVM equivalent. We run fully on Bitcoin and it's very, very easy to bridge um, to Botanics and back. Fantastic. So as we've seen in the Ethereum world, it certainly hasn't been a winner take all um, with so many layer twos and liquidity going everywhere. So I completely agree that it's great to see Stacks ecosystem doing well and there's room for so many more as well. Uh, reading in the website and taking away some of these points about staked Bitcoin and proof of stake um, and slashing and so forth, do you want to maybe talk about the things that you think Ethereum and maybe some of these layer twos have done well um, and the similarities that you've chosen to implement and then again take into that next level with with bitcoin instead of with ethereum or their own native token yeah no absolutely i think a lot of uh, good projects on ethereum have done it very well like uh, they've seen the future that basically the base layer is limited there's high transaction fees and there's a use case for those layer twos which is the same thing that's happening on bitcoin huge the transaction fees are like massively increasing. So now there's an actual use case for the layer twos. Um, and what they've done really well, is they've made it super easy to bridge. I think anyone who has used Lightning before, it's still very hard to use. Um, and so a lot of layer two projects have really optimized 
for that user experience. I can really see their focus on on the end user, and I uh, I really um, I enjoy seeing that uh, development. Um, so it's becoming way easier for people to basically yeah start using the uh, layer tools, go to the applications. Um, in, yeah, they have increased the speed, they've increased the throughput. So I think uh, they've done a lot of things very good. Uh, do you want to maybe talk about some of the applications um, within the botanics ecosystem that you would be excited to see or the people already working on a few? Um, what do you think are the best um, projects that you'd like to see be built on botanics? I really like that question because it's a really, really tough question to answer because basically once you have EVM equivalents, that mean every application on Ethereum can be deployed on Bitcoin with botanics. But it also means there's thousands of applications so which one do you like the most or what do you want to see? What what makes the most sense on Bitcoin? And what we think makes the most sense is basically Bitcoin DeFi. Bitcoin DeFi is very hard to build. We know that. Like a lot of people have tried to build uh, Bitcoin DeFi, but it still makes the most sense just because there's such a big capital pool. And all that capital pool is just sleeping, is just sitting there. It's not generating any native yield. It's not generating any targets. You cannot lend against it. And it's so many possibilities to basically use that um, capital pool. And I think once you have the right infrastructure available and you see those applications being built, then I think that will blow up very easily. Um, so that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, I would also point out that uh, there's a very interesting fact that comes alive once you have an EVM on Bitcoin um, because a lot of people have been looking towards like any Bitcoin to Ethereum bridge that's like still hard and mm -hmm. um, there's no one that really gained a lot of adoption there but once you have an EVM on Bitcoin like a decentralized EVM where everyone can run a full node you can very easily build an EVM EVM bridge to any other chain um, and so you can bridge Botanics Bitcoin to Ethereum become a decentralized version of wrapped Bitcoin and the other way around, you can very easily transfer your funds um, from Ethereum back to Bitcoin, which is quite a unique uh, proposition as well. Besides that, I think that the classics, you can start deploying an NFT marketplace very easily, exactly as we've seen on Ethereum. Um, you can basically have uh, trading. So I think a lot of Bitcoiners would like to trade as well, um, like more on the DGN side of things, who doesn't want to leverage Bitcoin 100X directly on Bitcoin? Yes. Um, to get directly Bitcoin back. Um, so it has a lot of different uh, possibilities. Uh, but the big one and the most obvious one, which I think is for a later stage, is stable coins. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense to have a stable coin natively on Bitcoin. I think uh, that's, a, that's a massive use case. I don't think it will be the first use case, but it's a big one. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that as well. Um, do you want to maybe talk about the security risks and the path to full decentralization? Because I know we've seen, you know, criticisms from some of the latter two ETH ecosystem projects about oh, how many key holders there are and, and multi sigs and, and, and whatnot. So is your journey, obviously, for small projects, they have to start somewhere in terms of the people involved, more centralized, and then grow to be, become um, fully decentralized. So do you want to maybe talk about the multi sig and, and how all that works? Absolutely, I love to talk about that because actually it's the one thing that brought uh, me to like designing the spider chain because it was a big frustration. Like this is actually quite uh, more becoming mainstream now, but like a year and a half ago, nobody realized that actually all the layer twos is just a multisig and it's still just a multisig. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can start asking your question, when is this going to go away from like a central party? Is that even possible? Like what if you actually cannot change the code anymore? Because you have the single multisig to be able to change the upgradability of the code. Um, but it's a very big risk if you no longer have that. So it makes sense that you want to keep that single multisig. Uh, but yeah, longer term, where is it going to play out? And so basically, the spider chain, um, and definitely recommend everyone to, to read the white paper. The spider chain is optimized where we built what we call decentralized multisigs. Um, so you create a network of decentralized multisigs between all the different stakers. So what we actually do is once you need to be decentralized, you also need a consensus. Um, so you build a proof of stake on Bitcoin. So you stake Bitcoin on Bitcoin and that secures the EVM. Yep. Um, and so it also means that all the node runners will have to stake Bitcoin. Um, and where the Bitcoin actually sits, so on Ethereum that sits in a centralized multisig, 
where the Bitcoin sits is in these decentralized multi-sigs. And let me explain that a little bit more. Um, for the people who are familiar with the Lightning Network, it's the only decentralized layer two because it's all two out of two multi-sigs um, distributed between, between a lot of different people. And yeah. so take that model in mind. Now, for example, we will create one single multi-sig, like um, 100 participants, and you have 10,000 stakers. For one single multi-sig, you choose 100 random participants out of the staker set, and they will secure one single multi-sig. Yeah. Um, and then you create a new one. Um, so the next Bitcoin block, or after a certain period of time, you create a new uh, multi-sig. You again choose randomly 100 participants out of the 10,000 stakers. And then you create a new multi-sig. And again, you choose random uh, 100 participants out of the 10,000 different stakers. And so after a while, you have this sub-network of all different multi-sigs that are completely decentralized, random chosen between the diff between the staker set. And that's yeah. what we call the decentralized multi-sigs. And that's how you actually decentralize that, um, that layer two. Um, Fantastic. So it's similar to how um, proof of stake on Ethereum gets its security from the randomness of who's validating the next block. Is that correct. right? It's yeah, exactly beautiful. That. Okay, cool. Um, do you want to maybe talk about some of the layer twos that um, have tokens and don't have tokens and where you see tokens as a good use case um, for layer twos in, just in general? No, absolutely. I think um, so. We want to build long term, like what makes the most sense um, for the future, so like 10 years from now. And so, my vision for the future is we are going to go a bit. To a bitcoin reserve currency or to a bitcoin standard which also means the whole world will run on bitcoin uh, which also means financial markets which also means stock markets which basically means everything in the world and you need an infrastructure for that um, and what makes the most sense is to actually have that actually run in bitcoin as well and so if you build second layers um, i strongly believe in terms of liquidity you also see longer term Everything liquidity always gets together to like uh, central parties because nobody keeps to like trading around, right? You see that. Um, that's why we have a, a single reserve currency over like the last 500 years that keeps changing from country to country. And so liquidity pulls together. And so I really align a lot with like the Arbitrum version there. Like um, when you go to Arbitrum, you pay gas fees and transaction fees in ETH, which makes the most sense because you have to think further than your layer two. If you want all like your public facing stock market, et cetera, to, uh, to work, it makes the most sense that they're also all like paying fees in Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, so we actually align a lot with the, with the Arbitrum vision there. Fantastic. Well, maybe going full circle and um, I said I'd ask you a question about the electrical engineering side of things. Um, any general thoughts on some of the energy usage that Bitcoin consumes in, in that debate. So I actually am very much in favor of the thinking that it can um, maybe accelerate the adoption of renewables when we see things like thermal, volcanic, Bitcoin mines, um, solar, you know, all those places. Um, and then I guess the second part of that question is, do you, with your knowledge, how do you see Bitcoin when people describe it as an energy-backed currency, um, whether it's from the sun or, as we said, geothermal, that type of thing? Is that how you view it as it continues to grow with fiat currency backed by nothing? Is Bitcoin that ultimate currency because it ultimately it's backed by energy? Yeah, I actually worked in the energy space a little bit. And this is an extremely interesting topic because you can keep writing research and research on it. Yes. Um, but in basic theory, I think it, and it, it just follows general principles, I think it will be very good. I fully align with you on that. And I see three very big reasons for it. Um, one of the reasons it will uh, spur adoption in renewables, like you said, because Bitcoin is the absolute only real free market. You have to compete for the cheapest form of energy. The cheapest form of energy is free energy. And if you know that 60% of the energy is wasted in the world, um, there's a lot of free energy. And so it will uh, navigate towards the cheapest forms of energy just naturally as a free market. And actually, there's a lot of free forms of, uh, of um, energy available all over the place. And one of the very good things I see playing out is exactly like uh, volcano thermal energy. Um, suddenly, those projects become profitable. 
same with like hydro uh, uh, water plants because like a lot of uh, water plants struggle because one of the big costs that are associated with hydro plants like it's remote so you have a long electricity grid and sometimes you have rainy season and you have like these big spikes and what do you do with that free energy all that energy is just lost now and you can basically start making money with that and so suddenly the business cases for those how to hydropower plants suddenly become way more profitable yeah um so that's one i think a second one um that also is very important is like grid balancing um, while a lot of like the, the electrical grid was way more balanced 20 years ago, now, now that we have a lot of renewables, a lot of grids are totally out of balance. And there's, you can say, okay, short term, you have batteries, but like, what do you do long term? And I think Texas is quite on the forefront of that, where actually a lot of Bitcoin miners make a deal with um, an electricity grid operator. If there's no wind, if there's no solar, we'll shut down. And that's a beautiful thing about Bitcoin mining. There's no other technology you can just like turn on and off. And then when it's on, it uses a lot of energy and you make money with it. If it's uh, if, if there's like very low energy, you can just turn it off instantly. Um, and so there's few aspects of Bitcoin mining. It needs very little uh, internet connections. You can put it anywhere and you can very quickly turn it on and off again. There's no other technology in the world that can actually do that. Yeah. Um, and so that's the second big one. And a third big one, um, I think, is um, flaring. So when you think about a lot of the emissions in the world, it's actually just flaring um, in places that you cannot get to. So, for example, if you have a, a deep water uh, platform or an oil platform um, or any platform, really, a lot of those emissions are not usable. Um, you cannot build a pipeline or not going to build a whole supply chain to that platform for a little bit of a certain gas. So the most obvious thing what you do is you just burn it. Like, why would you use it for anything else? Like, it's not even profited at all. So you take out the natural gas and you burn everything else that's in the stream. Um, now, instead of burning it, that's free wasted energy. Like, you can use that and basically um, turn that into energy and electricity and boom, like, you suddenly have a very clean burning um, because you need to optimize for energy. You can do it on a on a on a platform in the sea because you just need satellite internet connections, not that heavy what you need. Yeah. And so you suddenly avoid flaring. And that's actually a huge one because how are you ever gonna convince someone, for example, in Kazakhstan? Kazakhstan has a lot of methane emissions. How are you ever gonna convince them to re reduce methane emissions? It's almost impossible. Except for the free market. The free market can do that. If there's money to be made. Yeah. on like reducing methane emissions by uh, burning it, making electricity out of it and uh, making money out of it, you'll make sure that that will happen. And so these are all like drivers that drive towards like um, uh, very good things in terms of energy. Fantastic answer. Uh, I guess to wrap up, um, how can people get involved if they're interested in um, botanics, um, both just from maybe a user point of view? I know you're at the test net stage of the roadmap at the moment. Um, and developers, obviously, I'll put all the contact details for yourself, socials and whatever down in the description below. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, definitely I would like to ask any for anyone, like if you're a developer in the Ethereum space, but you always had like a little bit of heart for Bitcoin, um, definitely come check it out. Uh, it becomes very easy to start building on Bitcoin. Um, in terms of if you want to keep up to date, follow us on Twitter. It's at Botanics Labs. And in general, I would try everyone, um, I would recommend everyone to try out the testnet because it's one thing to like um, hear a vision. Okay, now we're going to build all these EVM dApps on Bitcoin. And it's another thing to actually see it play out. So it takes like five minutes, take it for a spin, bridge some Bitcoin from the testnet, see Bitcoin in your MetaMask, do some transactions, um, actually pay Bitcoin in gas fees. It goes very fast. It's, uh, it's a few seconds uh, per block. You can go to a DEX, very easily launch your token in five minutes, all on Bitcoin. Um, and so seeing it is a totally different experience than hearing it. So I definitely recommend follow the Twitter and take the testnet for a spin. Fantastic. Thoroughly enjoyed that conversation and brilliant answers. So thanks for coming on, Willem. And um, any final thoughts for people? No, uh, I hope you, you guys uh, enjoyed the conversation. And uh, yeah. Uh, definitely reach out if you're interested to connect. Fantastic. Hope you guys have enjoyed that one. I'll speak to you again soon. Cheers.